Good afternoon to everybody. I'm very glad to welcome you to this uh, third LLHE webinar organized by Carmen. And uh, unfortunately, Sabina could not be with us this afternoon, so I'll introduce the webinar. And um, whoops, I have a problem with my PowerPoint. No, okay, that's fine. Okay. So as you all know, I'm the uh, General Secretary of CERCLE from the University of Lorraine in France, where we recently had the uh, Ranacles Congress. Some of you may have been there. Uh, I just wanted to remind you of the uh, conditions for this webinar. Um, you are supposed to mute your microphones during the presentations and to use the chat for the questions and comments. Uh, the webinar uh, is recorded. I actually already started the recording. And so um, your participation is seen as consent. Uh, and the recordings will be accessible on the YouTube channel of CERC later on. Okay, is that okay for everybody? Yeah, okay. Uh, so this is the third webinar for the LLHE journal, which is the journal of CERC of, of, the, of our confederation. As you can see on the screen, uh, it tells you, it tells us about the different, all the uh, variety of research that is carried out by members, but also by people from beyond, since there are a lot of authors who are not necessarily members of CERCLE. It tells you about language teaching, language acquisition, blended learning, autonomous learning, language assessment, professional development, quality assurance, university language policies, and so on. And the idea is to try and disseminate the best results of research activities carried out at our language centers and at higher education departments all over the world, and to share ideas among professionals involved in language studies. I am not going to hold the floor any longer, and I will let Carmen now talk about the authors, if she wants to go on. Carmen, the floor is yours. And hello to everybody. Um, today, indeed, in, in, in Italy is a special day. And it's a special day because it is an important holiday. So this holiday is called, maybe some of you know, I'm sure that Ricardo and uh, Isabella know, um, it's what we call Festa dell'Immacolata. And this is considered like, uh, apart from the Catholic tradition, like the opening festivity um, that paves the way, like the day that paves the way to uh, Christmas time. So welcome on this, uh, uh, on this special day. Unfortunately, uh, Jill uh, was not with us. She couldn't be with us. And she sent some greetings uh, that I want to share with you. Um, also because uh, I'm totally in tune with what she's, uh, she's saying. Uh, Jill is saying, I'm so sorry not to be with you today, but I look forward at least to the recording of this important event. Thank you all for being here, especially to those who are giving up precious leap to take part in, uh, uh, to take part, and in particular, Ricardo. <laughs> Ricardo, you, you are in Melbourne, we know. We're also very proud to receive so many submissions from not only Circles members, as Anna mentioned uh, before, uh, but also from scholars uh, from much further afield. During our time, Jill is still saying, as editors in, in chief, uh, it has been encouraging to see how the number of submiss submissions uh, has increased. With the demands in the academic world for publication, we feel extremely responsible in our role in having to begin and finalize the selection process of papers to publish. Uh, then she says, uh, yeah, Carmen and I do enjoy 
which is very true, compiling each issue of language learning in higher education. Each number takes on a uniqueness as we find the keywords and themes running through, uh, which help us to create an order, an order in the table of contents. So we hope that each paper will stimulate our readers for their own practice and research, which in turn will become a future contribution to the debate. Um, and of course, as she's saying that we welcome here the interviews to authors of a selection of papers in the last two issues of our journal, journal included actually 11.1 uh, that was published uh, uh, was published, uh, uh, I think, a year ago in uh, 2021. They will give you and us a unique opportunity to get to know them better and to discover what stimulated them in particular to carry out the research. So she concludes by saying that we hope that the conversations that ensue will also be a stimulus for all our readers to discuss and take the, the topic further themselves. So she's looking forward that she ends up by saying to hearing you, and she wishes, uh, um, she sends a good, good wishes to us all. So these are the words uh, that Gillian sent to us, uh, but uh, let, let us move on because we also have a gift uh, for many authors, and I'm sure for many readers, because we can move to the next slide, Anna. Yeah, I'm trying to. Okay. <laughs> okay, that's it. Because yesterday, actually two days ago, the 12.2 issue uh, has been published online. And we would like to share some images with you, just going through the De Greuter website. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to do it, but I'm not, you know, this is, uh, I'm not on the correct page. I believe. Okay, I'll go there. Sorry. Okay, here I am. Yeah, here we are. The De Greuter yeah. the yeah. website. Uh, uh, it was due in October. We were a little bit late, we must admit. But uh, um, two days ago, it was published. As you can see here, you can find, uh, you know, those green uh, green uh, um, words, uh, publicly available, licensed. Uh, and if we continue a little bit further down, you will also find uh, some articles uh, that are, um, okay, labeled as open access. Mm -hmm. So in other words, uh, you have the opportunity, thanks to circles uh, and in the open, open access uh, um, uh, option uh, to read the articles, uh, to read the articles uh, that appear in, uh, in, uh, in, every, um, in every issue. Once again, this is uh, the opportunity the circles uh, gives to um, circles members, uh, but uh, with the open access, uh, any any member, any author, any reader can access uh, access the um, the articles. Um, Anna, if you can click on front matter for a second, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you will find. Uh, okay, here it shows the front matter of the issue. Okay, just. Uh, uh, let us get to the content page. And in the content page, you can see once again, the, 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 uh, the topics uh, that are so popular when uh, we, we receive, uh, we receive uh, uh, so many articles focusing on uh, plurilingual language policies, effective factors. In this issue, you will find uh, um, articles uh, dealing with language anxiety, um, due also to, unfortunately, COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, we will find a special section. There is this section, uh, Pilar and Nodette will be talking about it later on, on sustainable development literacy. And there, there is a, a small but very interesting selection of articles on uh, um, bibliographical 
uh, references uh, on uh, um, English as a lingua franca for ESD, education for uh, sustainable development, uh, an article that deals uh, with research-based learning approaches uh, in two different contexts, uh, Italy and Germany, and so on. And also a couple of reports, uh, if I'm not mistaken, if I remember correctly, two reports, uh, um, once again, about uh, um, sustainability uh, in, the, in the curriculum. But uh, as I said, uh, we will have the chance to talk about these issues uh, with uh, uh, Pilar and Odette later on. We can move back uh, to the authors at this point. Uh, we can turn back to the... Okay, I'll go back to the uh, PowerPoint. Okay. Okay. And, okay. and uh, as you know from the program, we welcome today Riccardo Morati, Elisabetta Ferrari, the they're settled at University of Melbourne. They will be talking about podcasting as project-based learning. And it will be nice to see this uh, um, moving from Melbourne to Basel with Stephen Mayer and then, uh, and then uh, Italy. Julia, Julia uh, Delgado and Laurent uh, will be talking with uh, uh, Barbara Sawika, she settled in uh, Poznan, and it will be about uh, assessing verbal interaction, but in particular, the, the, the important aspect of uh, European harmonization when talking about assessment. Odette and uh, Pilar, as I said, the sustainable development. Um, this time it's me uh, interviewing them. I wanted to be with them because I'm, I've been and I'm always so much involved uh, with this, uh, with this uh, um, topic, uh, not only as a language educator, but also as a citizen. Just to, to give you an idea, like this coming Sunday, I will be with young people here in my town uh, collecting plastic waste along the streets. I will be with them, so you can imagine. And then we have Pete Westbrook with Thomas um, talking about a, a very hot issue that is uh, university uh, uh, language competencies, actually, for university admin staff. And once again, it's nice to see that there is uh, uh, these webinars that give the chance not only to get to know the authors, but, and especially to, to create this bridge between, uh, for example, in this case that uh, we go from beautiful Copenhagen to beautiful Salento. So it's nice to see this, uh, this uh, uh, cultural and even geographical um, mix. Okay, I'll give the floor to you, Anne, at this point, and you can introduce uh, the first. Okay, so um, thank you very much, Carmen, for introducing the webinar. And I guess that we'll now give the floor to Ricardo and Elisabetta with uh, Stefan, who will interview them. So when, whenever you want to start, you can, and I will probably stop sharing my screen. It will be easier so that we can see them. There we are. So Ricardo, Elisabetta, and Stefan, whenever you want to start, the floor is yours. Super, thank you very much. I'll just jump thank right you. in there. Um, apologies to the two authors, to Ricardo and Elisabetta, that you've ended up with a person in Switzerland who knows no Italian. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I did, um, yeah. Um, I did, however, have an opportunity to listen to some of the podcasts that uh, you've been making with your students, and they sound very attractive to me, even as someone who understands virtually nothing of what was being said. Um, if I could very quickly have a screen share, um, so Anne, uh, Anne, if you could uh... allow that for me. Okay. I guess you should be able to share now. That looks absolutely right. Okay, good. Um, so this is um, the article that we're talking about, about podcasting. Um, and two important points mentioned already in um, the title, namely project-based learning and the um, dual focus on the acquisition of linguistic and non-linguistic skills. And um, I'd like to just 
cover three issues here um, that are treated in um, this article, some of the more directly and some of the more as framing uh, points. Um, the one is really just the focus on this podcasting skills and the podcasting course itself. Um, then the second thing I'd like us to look at is the whole issue of work integrated learning in the humanities and in language learning um, specifically. And then the third thing that you address um, this bigger frame of evidence-based language instruction. So those are the three topics that I'd like us to focus on. And I'd like to start off to both of you. I mean, you can select who would like to answer. Um, very, very simply, why podcasts? So what's so great about this medium uh, and this genre that makes it a valuable, intro, uh, a valuable instrument? And here I distinguish between, firstly, a valuable instrument for language learning and secondly, um, as a valuable target genre that we want our learners to master. Uh, also given uh, the fact that there are other oral and written forms competing with us around this, uh, around this specific genre. So, um, who would like to start? Um, I, I can start. Um, so Super. thank you so much. Thank you so much, Stefan, for... Um, uh, for the question, um, and thanks, thank you for the special mention, Carmen. <laughs> that was uh, really nice. Um, so, um, in the project, uh, we um, we ask students to write um, and record uh, a podcast uh, in Italian. So they have to work for uh, an extended period of time on uh, creating a podcast. And the main reason why we decided to focus on this genre in particular is that. Um, uh, the, the project itself is based on a collaboration with uh, um, a radio broadcasting service in Australia um, called uh, SBS Italian. Um, and SBS Italian uh, produces, po produces podcasts for the Italian community in Australia and also to, uh, for, for language learners. Uh, they have, for example, um, a, a program called um, Slow Italian Fast Learning. And uh, over the years, we have incorporated podcasts uh, in our classes as part of uh, uh, listening comprehension activities. So what we wanted to do was to, to turn our students from users of podcasts to uh, producers. Um, so there was a, a, a real communicative event uh, behind uh, the idea of using a podcast. There was a, um, we wanted them to, uh, I think there's some background noise. Yeah. Uh, so we wanted them to uh, produce a podcast uh, for a real audience, um, uh, which uh, is SBS Italian. Um, the podcasts produced by students are used in classes learning materials, but are also sub some selected podcasts are also submitted to the uh, to the radio station um, for potential broadcasting. So we thought that that could could have um, created sort of a um, you know a additional motivation for students to. Uh, not just not not just to complete an academic exercise, but to produce something tangible that could be enjoyed by others as well. And um, an additional reasons uh, for using podcasts is um, we we had a look at uh, existing literature on podcasting uh, in language learning, and uh, we've seen that um, um, there's there's generally agreement in the literature that. Um, Podcasts uh, are very appealing to to young young people, um, which is something that um, you know we also uh, could um, uh, could see in our classes. So students generally listen to podcasts uh, in their free time. Uh, they are familiar already with uh, the conventions of podcasts because it's something it's a medium that they they generally know very well, and. Um, an additional benefit of uh, of podcasts is that um, they they bring uh, informal language into the classroom, uh, which is something that um, uh, is uh, not commonly done at university. The focus uh, often is on uh, um, more formal um, academic um, uh, forms. So, for example, uh, classroom presentations or essays or film reviews, where students have to use. Uh, very formal language. Uh, so the benefits of uh, of podcasts is that they bring this informal style to the attention of the learners. So, for example, we work a lot in class on uh, conventions of spoken Italian, like fillers or interjections uh, that are uh, definitely useful to uh, to learners. 
Um, and um, we've also looked at uh, and, uh, literature on uh, the effect on, of podcasting on the acquisition of language skills. And we've seen that uh, another benefits of podcasts uh, and particularly having students record a podcast is that we um, encourage uh, that, that this kind of activity encourages uh, a reflection on pronunciation, uh, which again is something that is uh, sometimes overlooked in language classes. Um, so by having students uh, record a podcast, um, we, we want them to uh, really reflect on uh, um, the way they speak, uh, the rhythm, the intonation um, that, that, that they use. And, and so we have incorporated, as uh, we'll uh, explain later, some um, elements um, related to pronunciation as some, some, some uh, training, um, uh, some training um, prog programs related to pronunciation within our, um, our program. Um, and um, another thing I wanted to mention is that uh, we, um, the, the podcast project that we present in our um, in our article replaces uh, an oral presentation that was done previously uh, in in the subject. And uh, the benefit of having uh, this podcast project is that uh, we can test both uh, re uh, writing skills and oral skills. Um, so um, it's uh, and, and writing skills because students produce a script and, and also um, have to um, record it. Um, and and, and the, the additional um, uh, the additional element that makes uh, podcasting um, a good idea for um, for our project is that uh, we've seen in the past that um, classroom presentations are generally anxiety inducing for students. They have to uh, speak uh, in front of the class um, and. Uh, generally, um, you know, it's a one-off event. Uh, it's something that uh, they just have to do to, 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 you know, fulfill an academic uh, uh, task. Uh, whereas uh, with the with the podcast projects, uh, they have the opportunity to receive feedback um, in a more um, in a less anxiety-inducing environment in the recording studio with their uh, small group and a teacher present. Um, and so we've seen that uh, that has uh, that reduces the, the the anxiety that is normally associated with uh, classroom presentations. Thanks a lot, Ricardo. Um, just before we move on to the next question, and maybe uh, Elizabeth would like to pick up on some things there. Uh, but if anyone has any questions, as Carmen mentioned, that you could post, start posting them on the chat. Um, I'm, I'm sure you have suggestions, ideas, or whatever. Um, the next question to me would really be sort of the um, concrete nuts and bolts stuff. So if you can walk us through the course, through the different phases, um, maybe also indicating what the specific aims were of each phase, the more of, um, uh, language acquisition aims uh, were in each phase. And for um, other participants who might want to try out something similar, if you could already <laughs> alert us to what it is that we need to watch out for hmm? uh, from the, uh, so that we can learn from your experience. Um, I don't know. Once again, I mean, the two of yeah. you uh, as co-authors just go ahead and decide who would like to yeah. join in there. Yeah, maybe I can pitch in on this and mm -hmm. just uh, go through a little bit of the structure that we have developed. So this, as Ricardo mentioned, is part of the assessment for the students, and it is about the 20% of the assessment. So it's only one part of the uh, overall assessment uh, of the course. Um, our semester is divided in 12 weeks, and so the project, this podcast project, as, as we call it, um, is uh, really broken down in three phases and the first three weeks we um, spend a lot of time with the student trying to uh, make them get them familiar with uh, um, other podcasts produced by radio uh, by listening doing activities uh, so that they kind of become familiar with the medium and with uh, um, you know podcast in Italian um, after these first three weeks and uh, it, it when we can, we also ask someone from this SBS radio in uh, Australia that, that they produce programs, uh, radio programs in Italian to maybe 
participate uh, via Zoom or just uh, come into the classroom and speak with the students. After that, we spent uh, from week four to week nine really producing their podcast. So we give students a very, a very a, a broad themes. We, we ask them to produce a podcast of about five, six minutes, not more than that. We divide them in group, about three, sometimes four students per group, but not more than that. And I have to add that uh, um, in our university, we have got a recording, a professional recording studio that we can use, and that, that certainly added to the experience. But um, as I might mention it later, during the COVID period where we were in lockdown for an extremely long time, we actually continue with the, with the project and ask the student to produce the, um, um, you know, to the, the podcast uh, uh, by themselves via Zoom, and that worked very well as well. So uh, in, in that second phase, we, we, we asked the student to produce a podcast that has got to do with the um, um, issues or um, themes that relate to uh, Italian studies, the um, issues that might relate to um, uh, the life of students of Italian uh, or events that are happening in the Italian community. So they can do interviews, for example, if there are, I don't know, there might be a, an Italian film festival or uh, other events. Um, so we asked the student to do uh, a little bit of research and to prepare a script. And that will be the script that the student will use during the podcast recording. Now, that script that they produce, uh, it's one piece of assessment that comes to us as um, lecturers and teachers and tutors, and we mark it and we correct it so that then we can send it back to the student with additional feedback. And by the time the students go into the recording studio, they have got a script that is perfect. And therefore, their recording will be with uh, a script that is uh, uh, correct, with uh, uh, corrected, and uh, uh, but we have also been able to assess their Italian written skills via the first draft that comes to us. Um, after that, students again in groups, they do the recording um, and they spend about from 30 minutes to an hour in the recording studio just to do uh, that uh, uh, five minutes, so, you know, they can do different takes. Uh, we are usually there to encourage them or to give them feedback on their pronunciation. Um, and then we have got a, um, um, a technician that uh, uh, actually edits everything and, and music, so my, um, you know, puts in interviews and everything. Now, the last three weeks of the semester, we use those podcasts in class um, as part of teaching material. And that again, is usually um, really welcomed by the students. They, they're really proud of the product. Let's say that they have uh, prepared and we use them in class. We create activities. Students are asked to listen to them and comment uh, or, you know, make suggestions. And so really that, that podcast that they have created, it becomes something that is then shared uh, amongst other students. And, and I think that's really important because in a way, we we, 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 we have talked a lot in, in the last few years in our university about the idea of co-curriculum so that the, uh, working with the student to prepare material that is then shared in class and in a way it gives ownership to the students. So that's, you know, uh, that the, 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 the structure of this project. And it, it, there's been a few changes, you know, especially during that uh, um, uh, COVID period and especially uh, the, the lockdown period that in Melbourne, especially, we have got, uh, um, you know, um, it's one of the cities that had the longest, uh, you know, lockdown, I think, all of the world, probably. Uh, so we had a, in a, a very long lockdown. And so um, mm -hmm. we, we continue using that uh, structure and it did really work quite well. I'm going to put the light on maybe because it's very dark here now. Thank you very much for that overview of, of 
um, of the different phases. I think if one is teaching, it's always important to understand each of these phases and the different mm -hmm. aims uh, if one wants to um, also try out something similar. Uh, in terms of um, work integrated learning, you've already pointed out the importance of um, having a professional studio and also um, working with um, the SBS uh, Italiano. Um, regrettably, we only have another minute and a half available. Um, so I would really like to uh, use this moment to ask you about uh, the importance of ev evidence-based language instruction. Um, why is it so important that teaching should be based on research, of which yours is an example. Um, what can practitioners learn from studying evidence-based report studies, like the one that you've given to us? And if you, I'm sorry to request that you keep this to a minute and a half. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't know, Ricardo, do you want to go? Do you want me to go? or? Um, yeah, I'm happy to, to start and then yeah, if you want to yeah, add anything. Okay. Yeah, um, okay. Yeah, so um, we, that, that's something that we, we know at the beginning of our article that um, the majority of research that uh, is done uh, in, in applied linguistics focuses on uh, conceptual issues um, rather than on pedagogy. Um, and uh, this um, is, um, so the research mostly addresses um, researchers rather than teachers. Um, and this can contribute to strengthening the ivory tower uh, in, in, in academia, so distancing teachers from, from research. So uh, what we wanted to do with our study was to um, um, sort of uh, share um, the, the findings on the effectiveness of our project um, so that um, other teachers could uh, implement it um, in, in their classes. So we were thinking about teachers as our main uh, um, audience um, and um, perhaps uh, something that we want to um, uh, we wanted to um, to do was yet yeah, to provide some useful data uh, to show what works in the project and what doesn't for, for future implementations. Um, and in, in a more general sense, I think uh, that our research shows that um, how important it is for teachers to uh, reflect on their own practice um, and also to follow evidence-based uh, teaching. Um, that is, uh, it, it's important for teachers to propose activities that um, um, that research has shown uh, to be effective um, and, and there's uh, an, a clear impact on, on student learning. Um, and of course, you know, if we know that uh, an activity is based on a solid, um, on a solid theoretical framework, uh, if we know that um, it's, uh, it's an activity that um, has a clear impact on students, um, it's likely that if it's implemented in another context, it's going to have um, a good impact. Um, so, um, yeah, Elisabetta, do you? Yeah, want and, to add and maybe just adding the fact that because it is a project based learning activities, what the students are developing are not just linguistic skills, but other skills that more and more universities are asking us to reflect on. So, uh, in for example, in, in, in our um, surveys that we, we, we have done at the end of the project, we can see that most of the students, they um, seem to have developed teamworks, uh, uh, for example, skills uh, or problem solving, uh, time management skills. And those are all skills that they can then be applied easily to their workforce experience, you know, once they have finished uh, their degree. And I think it's very important for them to learn alongside their linguistic skills, of course, other skills that are much more, um, that, that, that will be really useful in their working careers as, uh, you know, um, um, in their future lives. So uh, that was a very important. So, and we talked about what in integrated learning because we had started a project with the SBS radio. Unfortunately, the COVID period has really, you know, um, 
didn't allow us to, um, you know, um, in a way to 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 explore that further. But um, we have restarted again, and uh, and it is a project that can be very easily, uh, you know, be organised with a local radio station, or you know, um, um, or the, as the example that we have taken with SBS Radio Italian, that we can have a collaboration, and the student could do internship and. And, uh, could uh, have a collaboration. And uh, yeah, when you come, oh yes, Stefan, sorry. No, uh, what I what I wanted to say was uh, that uh, we work integrated learning. Of course, you know the, the most typical um, uh, form of work integrated learning is to have work placements. But uh, there's also um, research showing that uh, proposing uh, project based learning in the classroom, uh, as, as Elisabetta was saying, could also lead to the development of uh, work-related skills. So um, essentially, by having students working uh, on a project for an extended period of time, um, we, we can recreate um, a sort, of, sort of like a work environment in the classroom um, so that students learn uh, work-related skills while also developing their language skills, uh, as was the case for our project. Super. Thank you very, very much for being available to give us um, a taste of um, extra details um, around that article. I'd really uh, encourage uh, the rest of you to look at it. There's lots of further details on things to watch out for during teaching, for aims to consider in the different phases. Um, there's uh, mixed methods, empirical um, data available uh, that can help you in designing a course like this or even pursuing your research on this topic. Topic. So thank you very much. You've certainly convinced me it's something that I want to try out with my students. And uh, yeah, thanks a lot. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, thank you very much for the three of you. I, I think we don't have more time for, uh, but pr there's probably going to be a lot of questions afterwards. And um, uh, some people might perhaps uh, write their questions in the discussion section. I, I, Thank you very much. Um, and uh, I think that uh, there might be a little bit of a problem in the fact that I I, won't, I'm, I'm, I have to excuse myself, I won't be able to stay because I've got an activity with a student and I'm here. <laughs> I'm in Italy teaching. Ricardo, I don't think uh, you, yeah. you're probably not able to stay as yet. Yes, for the two hours, yeah. Considering Ricardo is almost three o'clock in the morning <laughs> Yeah. Um, I don't know, uh, uh, Stefan, if uh, we can take question now. Um, I'm, I'm really sorry for the fact that we both cannot stay until the end of the webinar, but... Um... I don't know. What, what do you think about it, Carmen? Do we have yeah, time I, for... No, I think it's absolutely fine. We gave it for granted that Ricardo wants to go to bed. <laughs> <the next point. laughs> it was this. Uh, yes, uh, uh, just a few things. Uh, I think there is Evelina, Evelina uh, saying, what about using Audacity instead of recording studio? Mm -hmm. And then she also adds, thank you, great ideas about using project-based language learning and then the level of the students. So maybe you can take... Uh, yeah, uh, um, I have to say that I don't know audacity, but, but probably it would be uh, possible. And But as I said, during uh, the COVID period when we were teaching online, I actually continue, we continue with a project with the student and we asked the student to do the recording by themselves. Mainly they used... Um, Zoom, they recorded anything on their phone, they did the editing, and they actually did a fantastic job. So I think that even a normal phone or even, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Zoom it allows to do quite, a, uh, um, you know, to create quite a good uh, uh, product. Um, as for the level of the student, these are students that are uh, in their second year and that they have started as beginners. So they are, they have done this is their fourth semester of Italian. So it's the yeah, second year beginners. And it's quite amazing what they can do, I think, uh, considering mm -hmm. that it's quite a, a low, you know, um, just the second year of beginners. Thank you. Thank you.
And thank you for um, Stefan for the link to Audacity. <laughs> Yes, I know one German university, they also have uh, like the whole course for podcasting uh, and they, they do everything the about us. They, they don't need uh, some, some recording studio or things like that. But all in all, thank you. Great ideas. Uh, engaging students and goal oriented uh, learning like uh, projects which have some learning artifacts uh, uh, that need to be produced at the end of it then it's a great idea then because students usually see language learning like meaningless without mm -hmm. having these kind of products to be produced at the end of the project. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Velina. Thank you. Thank you very much to both of you and to uh, for the questions. Um, I think that perhaps uh, if there are no more questions, we can start with the uh, second uh, group of uh, authors, and that will be Julia and Laurent, who will be interviewed by Barbara Savica from uh, um, Poland. So we'll have somebody in Spain, yes. then in France, and then in Poland. Yes, the floor thank you very in. much. Yes, thank you very much. So I have a pleasure to today to talk to Julia Zabala Delgado from Universidad Politecnica de Valencia in Spain and Laurent Rouvelior from Université Sorbonne Nouvelle uh, about their article. Um, and um, the title of your article was um, Assessing Verbal Interaction towards European harmonization. What, is, what was the context of that harmonization? Um, Laurent, will you please tell us a few words about that context? Thank you very much, uh, Barbara. It really is a pleasure to be with you this afternoon. So the context is clearly a European one. And uh, as we know, in uh, 2018, we started an official collaboration that was signed during the conference in Poznan. Uh, and uh, the, um, uh, the memorandum in question uh, was about to give birth to the NALTI network, the uh, network of university language testers in Europe. And we decided to uh, get together uh, and to uh, have uh, scientific interactions about our uh, certification system. And we decided to collaborate uh, and see uh, what we could do all together in order to improve uh, language assessment and uh, language certification processes in Europe. So we decided to uh, work on a paper with Julia uh, and uh, to just to, to work on this notion of interaction together, because we have taken part in an international conference in Grenoble in France, uh, and the uh, aim of which was to uh, uh, ask researchers about their way to assess competences, and notably interaction and warnings. Okay, right. Well, thank you very much. So we now have a general a uh, picture of what was the start, uh, the springboard for the article. Um, and uh, Julia, would you like to add anything to what Laurent has said? Well, yes, uh, uh, as Laurent said, this comes from NALTI, from uh, collaboration and the, the different projects that were organized as a result of the signing of this memorandum. And I think also the basis was the idea that uh, we had experts uh, from the different countries and we were working on assessment and we were working on our exams and we were looking at bibliography and we were looking at the literature, but uh, we thought that it would be a really, really good idea to work from experts from uh, other institutions because uh, we come from the same context. We, we come from universities and we thought it was a really, really good idea to try to work together in order to learn from each other. Yes, right. That's very important. A learning from each other. 
in our context. Yes, this is the, the way in which we progress. Uh, okay, so uh, that was the context. And now you have chosen a verbal interaction, right? As the material for your uh, collaboration and for your comparative studies. Why have you chosen this aspect of language ability? Well, it's um, uh, it's a very deep question, actually. Uh, the um, first reason, as I said, is that it all started off uh, with an international conference. Uh, and interaction was really at the heart of it. So we really wanted to work on interaction. Uh, and also because uh, we believe uh, that uh, interaction is the true essence of language and language activity. Uh, I'm a Bactinian myself. And uh, what I believe is that there is no possibility to uh, uh, work on language if you do not work on interaction. This is, of course, questionable, uh, but it really is something that I that I like to uh, put forward in my research. So working on interaction uh, was uh, not negotiable, you could say, and and uh, uh, a very difficult process because. Uh, um, the idea is that uh, assessing interaction uh, is uh, complicated. Interaction is a dynamic process uh, and it takes two to tango, you know. So two or three, by the way, it depends on which kind of interaction we're talking about. But uh, assessing that is clearly problematic in terms of uh, epistemology. So it, it is a great challenge and we, uh, we need to... Uh, uh, we need to tackle the issue because, as, as I said, if interaction is the true essence of language in real life, then we need for our students to assess interactional uh, capacities and, and performance. Uh, otherwise, what is it that we assess? That's, that's the question, you see. Yes, certainly. And it relates well, I think, to the previous uh, interview about podcasting, right? So that's that's absolutely, I absolutely go along with this idea that interaction is the essence of communication. Um, in your article, you wrote that, and I'm quoting, construct of speaking, the construct of speaking proficiency is complex to assess. What constitutes that? complexity? I think that the, the, in, in the literature, we always find that uh, speaking is very difficult to assess. And I think it's because of several reasons. First, because uh, speaking most of the time is a spontaneous. So uh, unless it's a planned speech, and this, of course, does exist, but most of our speaking in, in everyday life is spontaneous. So not only uh, do we co-construct meaning when we're interacting with other people, as Loan was saying before, but also we do it in real time. We don't plan for it. We don't have uh, notes for us to, when we speak, we don't have notes on what we're going to, to say. So when we're going to, when we try to assess Says that uh, the process is also in real time. So not only the speaker is speaking in real time, but the assessor as well, uh, most of the times, does work uh, in real time. Of course, there's this possibility of recording the speaking and then assessing it. But if we do that, we miss many of the things around the speaking act because speaking is not just the words we 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 emit it's also what's happening around us it's also non-verbal communication so uh that's one of the reasons why it, it's very difficult to assess but also because uh, we believe that uh, the construct of speaking is very very wide so how do you assess uh, speaking when this is such a wide uh, uh, construct, so many things to assess, when you need to do it in a practical way, particularly when you're doing it in, in an exam and you cannot have your students speak for an hour and a half on different topics to be able to assess whether they're doing it right or, or not. So you need to develop tests that allows allow you to 
evaluate uh, how your speaking, uh, how your students are speaking, but you need to do that in a limited uh, time. And you need to do it under circumstances that are less than ideal. And when I say less than ideal is because the the it's very difficult to create an authentic uh, speaking test because students are going to know they're in an exam. So uh, I think uh, the, the reasons why uh, this is so difficult to assess is because it's spontaneous, because it's done in real time, because the construct is very wide, uh, because practicality seems to go against uh, the validity of the of the test, because uh, for practical reasons, you, we cannot have uh, hour long uh, tests. And also because we need to elicit uh, the language from the students when they're in an exam is very difficult to some of them are are very very comfortable with speaking with in an exam but other students we really need to be able to elicit the language from them and if we don't do that well it might not be their fault it might also be our fault as language test developers or even as uh, examiners so yes we believe that uh, assessing or and, and that was also one of the reasons why we chose uh, speaking is really complicated to assess yeah it's very um, challenging to construct a good uh, interaction activity to elicit the language in a very short time and also to assess the language and not the personality of the speaker, right? Exactly. Because this is what, in fact, should be done, right? So, yes, it is very complex. Now, um, you, the task that you have undertaken in your article was to compare two assessment systems. Were they similar? Were they different? What are they like? What are the similarities and what are the differences? Well, again, it's a, it's a very interesting question and, and quite difficult to answer in a few words, but we'll try. What really uh, prompted us to do this research together is that, in fact, the two certification systems are different. Uh, but we, we use different ways to perhaps pursue the same aim. And this is uh, already enough to start uh, a scientific collaboration, if you want. The class uh, is uh, totally task-based, and you can even say scenarized. The idea is that action-oriented. The idea is that all the different subparts constituted, constituting it uh, oral comprehension, written, written interaction, written, sorry, comprehension, uh, interaction at the end, uh, written production, all those elements are linked together and they're part of a, uh, of a wider picture, which is a scenario. And the idea is that the, um, uh, the candidate uh, has to complete a mission uh, to understand something about a, a very often societal problem like should we use he cigarettes or things like that? Are they better than the traditional ones? And, and there are issues about it, et cetera, et cetera. Is it better for the health? Is it worth uh, that kind of stuff? And the students have to go through documents. And at the end of the, of the process, they must interact together and defend the point of view on it and get to compromise. So what we wanted to do is what, is generally, generally referred to as a meaningful exam. That is a, an exam which in fact um, mirrors uh, the reality outside and the way we work with language. Uh, and we, we've, always, we, we've all been part of meetings where we had to present our own um, view and then compromise with colleagues to get to a, um, a solution and a concrete one to, to move forward. So that's what happens in real life. And that's what the, the, the class wants to put forward, as Julia was saying, that in fact, um, it is important that um, what happens in assessment is clearly linked to what happens in real life in terms of language use. So from the time the CFR was published in, in, in the years 2000, the class was conceived with this idea of 
orienting it towards action. And so in other words, you conduct your students who take the class examination, conduct a kind of research in order to present the results to a group, a particular uh, society or social group. Yes, uh, this is how I understand that. That's, the, that's part of the scenario, but they don't actually do research. We provide them with the documents, uh, video documents or just texts uh, that integrate several points of view on the topic in question. Uh, and uh, they, it is their job to uh, um, get the arguments together and uh, um, adopt, first of all, a neutral point of view and see what uh, everybody is saying about it. And then um, we ask them to defend, it's a role play basically, and we ask them to defend one uh, perspective that has been present in the uh, document since the beginning of the, uh, uh, of the evaluation process, you could say. Okay, so it's just, it's just well. like, a, yes, yeah, so it's just like a pre-research role play. Yeah, something like that, actually. <laughs> And I what we well. thought was, was very interesting was that in our case, for us, context is very, very important. And also uh, the, the fact that we need our students to produce. So the, the productive skills are very, very important, speaking and writing. So that was a similarity between our, our context. But uh, our exams are, are designed completely, well, not completely different, but in a different way, because we have a very strong psychometric approach so in our case uh the skills or or well the, the skills are are examined independently so we have a reading section or reading paper we have a listening paper writing uh, a written paper and a speaking paper so in our case it's four different sections and and each section is is completely independent from the rest but we did have in common the fact that each of the sections has a context or each of the tasks has uh, a context and students have to perform these tasks in contents, the context. So we thought that was something that was similar in, in both of our systems, which is context was very important and the productive skills were very important. So it was interesting to see how we approach this from two very, very, not very different. <inaudible> Uh, I'm afraid. Yes, we've got a background noise. So, yes. so we thought that was interesting that we were approaching the same problem or the same situation from two different directions, and that's what we thought was important. Yeah, and you, uh, in your examination, in your certification system, you emphasize the uh, role of skills. Yes, and interaction is uh, certainly a very important, crucial, productive skill. Exactly mm -hmm. right. So that was the the uh, uh, things uh, uh, thing in common, right? Now, so what was the outcome? What was the outcome of the uh, research of your studies, Julia? What was the outcome? I think the main outcome was that we did learn from each other and and in fact we we are applying things we learned from the other system into our system so i think that was the main uh, outcome which is that when you see how uh, another certification works you find out that many of the problems you were having were problems they were having as well and in some cases they've all they found a way to solve them so it's a question of not reinventing the wheel if uh, there's another group or there's another certification, there's another national certification that has found a solution to your problem, why not learn from that solution and apply that into your own context? Maybe you will need to adapt it to, to the way you work, obviously. But I think the main outcome was that we did uh, learn from each other and we were able to apply what we have, had learned into our work. And I think that was the, the, the main thing. Yeah, right, yes. Yeah. And sometimes even there is some synergy uh, that is uh, when discussing the problems, yes, even if there are no ready-made uh, answers, the um, 
the solutions sometimes are born through the discussions. And that's also very interesting. Laurent, would you like to add anything? Yes, maybe to give a concrete example, I totally agree with uh, what Julia said for a change. And and uh, the uh, very, uh, let's say, simple idea is that we um, got inspiration from the marking schemes, the, the grids that uh, Atlas uh, had come out with. Uh, and we wanted to some sort of evolution on, on the class C1, notably, because our, our grids were extremely binary uh, and qualitative, uh, saying this is validated, this is not validated. And the, uh, the, the people from Atlas had worked on a scalar vision, uh, a scored one, uh, with a score from one to five, uh, with qualitative criteria. So the idea of mixing uh, a qualitative perspective with a scoring process was extremely interesting to, uh, to us because it clearly is a social demand from recruiters, uh, companies, and what are, they want to read scores. And, and we have to thank other certification, private ones, uh, for that, basically. But that's the idea. So we wanted some adaptation, and, and we used the, the Spanish grids. And I, I tried to work on that and adapt it to the class system. And that actually works quite nicely. We have to uh, test it uh, in real life. But it, it, on paper, uh, it seems to be quite efficient. And this is directly inspired, inspired from the uh, scientific collaboration. So you see, it's a good thing. I mean, it, it took us some time to adapt it. But of course, a lot less than if we had to uh, if we had had to conceive everything. So we started from the solutions that the uh, Atlas uh, uh, people had already thought of. And in our case, we had this problem of every time we thought about integrating more context, we had this problem about how we're we going to do that in a practical way. This is not going to be possible in a university setting. And then when we saw how, how CLESS was doing it, then you realize that they were able to do that in a way that was still practical. Of course, it took a bit longer, but it was possible and it was and it was feasible. So in our case, we we learned or we we looked into how they were doing it and then you realize that this is a possibility for us as well maybe we will not reach the level of uh, uh, scenario based testing but uh, there is it's not between I mean between zero and one there's a lot so we could apply many of the thing of these things to add more context into our test because we thought maybe our tests were missing a bit of that. So we also learned from them that maybe, uh, well, not maybe, positively, we could introduce much more context into our exams without actually uh, changing the whole thing. We could uh, we we could learn from them and add. To, to what we were doing already. And this is something that also needs to be tested uh, in real life, but that we're already working on. So, so I, think, I think it was very positive. It, it was, we learned a lot. Yeah. So the output is uh, certainly for the uh, advantage, to the advantage of the language test user, because on the one hand, as I understand, the tests will be more, uh, contextualized that would be helpful for the test taker and on the other hand with the class situation the test user will have more information about how good the test taker completed the test yeah okay wonderful do we have still time for one more question to round up what are uh, yeah a very rapid one because uh very rapid one yeah. okay yeah. so what yeah. are your plans as as regards the collaboration very quickly uh we are working on organizing a standard setting with all the european certifications that are part of nalti and i it was very quick and if uh, Anna, I have a, I have an extra question at this point. Are you going to share it with circles? <laughs> oh, that was, that's Laurent, 
Yeah, that's a very interesting transition, Carmen, because uh, uh, another possibility, uh, a sequel to the article that we published in LLHC, would be perhaps to, to have a special issue uh, concerning the um, NALTI network and all these standard sessions, all these standard setting sessions that we are planning, and also things on the constructs of each certification system uh, to compare them and to perhaps uh, make it more visible because there is not much uh, about multi on paper. And we have decided, we decided at the very beginning that we wanted to be clearly related to circles under the umbrella of circles. And this is why the, the, the memorandum was signed in Poznan. We really want to be Europeans and we, we really want to be circles members. So we think that if people agree with that, we might propose uh, uh, some sort of special issue that would uh, give a, a wider, let's say, vision of what NALTI is all about, because we've been working now for, let's say, four or five years, and there definitely are results and things that we must uh, write about. Sure, it would be a very good idea. Thank you very much to the three of you. And I think yeah. uh, we should uh, we should have the next uh, authors, Odette Gaboden and Pilar Molina, interviewed by Carmen. So Carmen, the floor is yours for approximately 20 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. I, I, I probably forgot to mention before when I introduced the authors that Odette Gaboden and Pilar Molina uh, our uh, guest editors, they have been guest editors uh, uh, for this uh, 12 uh, uh, point two uh, issue. And in fact, uh, we received uh, uh, Odette and Pilar's proposal as a response to our call for a special issue. You, you just mentioned that, Laurent, before that the, uh, the, the, the special issue was launched, uh, this call was launched uh, in 2021. And in fact, LLH features uh, a special issue every two years. And what, what does it happen? It, 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 we host uh, guest editors who want to share, who want to attract the, uh, the reader's attention to a special topic. And when we received uh, uh, Odette and Pilar's topic, we were soon intrigued by uh, the title that they uh, they uh, used, uh, and uh, and their strong motivation. I'm sure that they will share um, the, 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 their feelings uh, and their emotions today. Uh, we obviously we knew already about the so relevant the United Nations and UNESCO's objective of uh, encouraging or maybe I should say actually asking for the introduction of sustainable development uh, in education within uh, uh, 2030. So in education in a general um, perspective and language education in the specific. So the decision to, uh, to choose this topic, to select this topic um, and to appoint, uh, to, to, to appoint uh, Odette and Pilar this important commitment uh, of being guest editors uh, was fully shared uh, with the Circles Executive uh, uh, Committee. Um, please let me mention them, Sabina, Sabina Schaffner, Anne, of course, Chateau, Mia Panis, Marta Verdi, Tom Granger, and then uh, the, the person who strongly supports us in the organization's ambassador as well. Uh, all of us, but many, uh, I'm sure, in the field of education, but just as ordinary citizens, uh, strongly believe that this has become not a to-do action, but a must action to be implemented. And, uh, at, and at this point, uh, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's share some uh, research ideas with them. So, Odette and Pilar. My very fair question is very basic. What, are, what were the reasons and motivation that encourage you to propose a topic that brings attention to language education for sustainable development? Well, 
first of all, Carmen, we want to thank you and thank you uh, the, the journal for inviting us to be guest editors. It has been a pleasure, a great pleasure for us to work with you during, I don't know, it's been one or two years now, I've lost track. <laughs> Uh, one and a half. <laughs> one and a half. So it, it's, uh, it's been uh, great. Um, well, certainly the motivation is that uh, sustainable literacy has become very popular. And if you look at the language textbooks, they uh, introduce in different ways as a whole unit or in different sections of the book topics related to sustainability, uh, mainly about the, the environment. And, and then um, sustainable literacy is, a, is a very popular in the Irish universities. The, the different universities are developing programs or postgraduate uh, masters or courses uh, linked with sustainable level, uh, literacy. And our own university, TU Dublin, uh, has as one of its strategic goals, uh, sustainable literacy. And then we have also um, a community of practice group uh, that uh, Odette introduced me to participate in. And she's going to tell us a little bit about that community of practice group because it has been instrumental for us uh, to get more interested into sustainable literacy. Yeah, so thank you, uh, Carmen, and everybody here. Um, and so as, uh, as Pilar said, uh, you know, uh, education for sustainable development is very prevalent now, um, all, uh, at least in Ireland, for sure, you know, every university, um, every has uh, sustainable development goals in the forefront of their mind. And so as this um, was gaining traction in higher education in Ireland, um, some of our colleagues in TU Dublin decided to set up this uh, community of practice um, with a view to raising uh, sustainability literacy among colleagues and then ultimately among students as well. So they set up this community of practice just before uh, the onset of COVID in 2019. And uh, as soon as they did this, uh, we joined it, uh, Pilar and I, and uh, as we were participating in their initiatives, um, we became more and more informed about, um, you know, the different sustainability, uh, sustainable development goals, the different frameworks around it, the uh, UN's Agenda 2030 and all its targets and um, uh, a lot of work done by the UNESCO as well, um, you know, and if you were interested in uh, doing more around SDGs in your, in your, in your teaching, uh, I would definitely recommend uh, the work from the UNESCO, which is a very, very, very strong and rich resource um, to guide your teaching in that area. And so in turn, the community of practice motivated us to make stronger connections between uh, our own teaching and, and some of those sustainable development goals that we were really discovering and learning more about, as well as, you know, we were also learning about how to kind of um, develop the skills and attitudes among our students to uh, become more aware and to maybe ultimately, hopefully, uh, have students as well as staff changing their behaviours in relation to our sustainable um, uh, future. So, oh, like we know that many of our language colleagues uh, include to, to varying degrees sustainability topics uh, in, in their teaching. And when we saw uh, your call for a special issue issue on on uh, uh, for for the, for the for the journal, uh, we we just felt it was a really good opportunity to to bring uh, kudos to to our language colleagues, you know, not just in Ireland, but beyond, and to their practices and their reflections in that field of education for sustainable development. So that's how it really came about, you know, and how our motivation kind of developed from an initial engagement to a much deeper one through your opportunity. 
Thank you, Odette and Q Pilar. And my next question uh, um, moves uh, attention to the contributions that you, you, you we actually we actually received. Uh, and my question is: To what extent uh, you were were you satisfied uh, with what you received? Did you expect uh, more contributions? Uh, any aspect that, that attracted you in a particular way? Because uh, I think we have seven slash eight to seven, seven contributions, seven papers that we published. And you will be happy, I'll let you know, this, uh, we just arrived a couple of days ago, uh, an article that outside from the call deals with sustainable development. There's so many. That's lovely. <laughs> we, we are, uh, we're moving, you know, we're looking further in this direction. Please. Well, uh... We were very, uh, the, the, the contributions we got uh, were very interested. And, and also to find out that colleagues from different universities and different parts of, of the world were interested and they were um, putting into, into practice sustainable libera uh, literacy into, 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 their, into their teaching and into, into their practice. And the articles we got were very interesting. We, um, out of a, this, we had like six articles published and the bibliography review of uh, that uh, that uh, I did and and all of them they are practice based and it was very interesting because it coincides with the the, the main themes that I found um, reviewing the different articles and books that been that been published uh, mainly uh, lecturers and teachers they they write articles to show other colleagues how to to put uh, sustainable literacy into practice uh, to give ideas to incorporate uh, this uh, sustainable literacy into into their teaching and and the learning so out of um, the articles we, we have uh, this one by by Vanessa Marcella and Julia uh, excuse me, the pronunciation, but uh, Samofalova, they, they describe how using Instagram, and again, it links us with the, the first uh, um, interview that we had using, using uh, technology, but they use Instagram as a pedagogical tool, um, which helped them to raise environmental awareness into, into their students. But then we have another article about ethical issues and by, by Mirja and she applied the Bohemian dialogue and explains how to bring ethical thinking into, into the classroom. Again, a different approach helping students to change their, their motivation. Um, so the, the articles were, were very interesting. But at the same time, I think now uh, Odette is going to, to talk about uh, that our a slight disappointment of not having received uh, possibly more articles um, on, on the topic. Yeah, yeah, we thought we would be flooded with articles because given that, you know, it's so pervasive in, in public discourse, in the narrative that, you know, the, the, the higher education narrative everywhere, they, you know, it, we talk about sustainable development all the time and, you know, and the planet and it's so important that we talk. Surely, you know, there's going to be so many articles, um, but that didn't actually happen. So uh, uh, and then we, you know, we kind of started wondering why, why is it, uh, why is it like that? And I suppose my sense is maybe that, um, you know, language teachers are, are including uh, elements of sustainable literacy in their, in their teaching. But, but, but they're not really uh, applying it to research yet. And Perhaps that this might be because of uh, maybe a lack of awareness around the uh, the frameworks and the resources available to to frame that research, um, or also maybe um, I guess sustainable development and the education of it is probably quite a relatively um, a relatively new topic compared to areas that have been around for much longer, like literature or cinema or uh, linguistics. And those areas are the areas that traditionally 
are the maybe the base for um, for uh, research to 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 stem out of, and um, the fact that uh, education for sustainable development only I suppose emerged in the two thousands. Um, you know, it's taking that little bit longer maybe to filter through the education system and more so to through the research. Um, that, and especially then again into language research. So maybe that's one explanation as to why we didn't quite get quite as many as we would initially have thought. But you. certainly, yeah, uh, sorry. Uh, no, I mean, I just wanted to say, apart from this uh, like di disappointment, uh, uh, do you think that we have paved the way for a more detailed exploration of this field of study? It's very important that, and then uh, that maybe we we have uh, uh, paved the way for a more extended awareness of action that is uh, urgently needed in this direction. And for this reason, I'm also encouraging all of you to go and read the the special part. I, actually, the whole issue, but uh, the special section in particular. I mean, certainly we are because uh, this uh, research is caught in it. Um, so, and, and then because it's a cutting edge, we are just uh, building on what has been, uh, what has published, uh, has been published before. Um, the, the thing is that, as, as Odette said, this is kind of a very new area of research, especially it, it has been being researched for the last 20 years in de different disciplines, but uh, not in, in language, in language learning and teaching. And, and there are there isn't any monograph published yet on our discipline uh, about sustainable literacy. Uh, there are only two um, edited volumes, and one of them is only focused on environmental issues. The other one is more uh, broadened and uh, focused on the different areas of, of sustainability, uh, different issues on economy, um, social development, society, and, and all of that. But apart from that, uh, I, I think that what we published uh, in, in this journal really helps to, to develop um, this um, discipline and this topic uh, and, and help inspire we hope that it inspires uh, other other colleagues um, as, as you just uh, said Carmen to to write articles uh, and to see how and to reflect more than to see to reflect how they um, they 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 introduce um, sustainable literacy into their practice and and just uh, send an article to, an article uh, to you but also the importance of uh, be of a community of practice because if if, uh, if this is what uh, help helped me i i was already uh, just uh, using different topics through uh, one of my modules is uh, current affairs in in spanish and latin america and i was a uh, talking about sustainable issues in different ways, but I didn't realize that uh, I could link them with the sustainable development goals uh, of the 2030 agenda. So by, um, by being a, a member of this community of practice helping me and through Odette, who was uh, the one who introduced me to, to this area, uh, just um, to get uh, deeper into, into the, whole, the whole topic. And I have a final quick question for the two of you. And this is about, maybe you want to share it with, uh, with uh, our colleagues today, your experiences as uh, guest editors. What have you learned through this experience? <laughs> uh, it, it, it'd be very interesting for, for me, certainly it was the first time that I was a guest editor. You know, I've been, I am an, um, a reviewer, a peer reviewer of, of journals, or, or I've done it, I, ha, I am one of these peer reviewers for our own journal in TU Dublin, um, but uh, to be a guest editor is actually a slightly different experience in the sense that you really get a very good uh, insight into the topic that you're already passionate about, but you, you, you know, you, you, you get to read firsthand all these articles that come into you, 
and you discover something, you know, you, you kind of get a very rich sense of what's going on elsewhere and the different approaches as well that, that people adopt to, to teach uh, um, a topic that, that, you know, that, you, that we both, Pilar and I, are already teaching in our own practices. But um, you just get these different insights of how uh, people are doing something similar to you, but maybe in a, quite a different way. And in some really interesting uh, learning there for, for me. Um, and maybe because as a guest editor, you have to read all these articles really closely. Um, you know, it gives you that greater in-depth understanding of, of what they're presenting as well, because maybe if you're just reading, picking up a journal, you know, you might glance through it, you might read a bit of an article and a bit of another one, whereas in, in, as a guest editor, you just really have to read it very closely and therefore you, you take much greater ownership of, of, yeah. of what you read. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's a totally different perspective, as I as I said before. Thank you, Odette. Thank you, Pilar. Uh, Thank you, Carmen. Thank you. It's all, it's all from us, and uh, the floor goes back to you. Okay, thank you very much uh, to the three of you. Um, I think that now we will have uh, the last author, Pete Westbrook, who will be interviewed by Thomas Christensen. And then afterwards, we'll have some time for questions for about the, all the presentations. So uh, Pete and Thomas, the floor is yours, whenever you're- Thank you, can, can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, good, and then Peter, I can't see you yet. I'm here, I'm right oh, next to you. <laughs> okay, nice to see you, okay. You okay, so um, uh, Peter's article is about a course for administrative staff at the university of Copenhagen um, and um, in your article something that interested me straight away was this um, the center you have for the internationalization and parallel language use at the University of Copenhagen and I, I just wondered if you could say something about that. Yeah that's that's probably a very good starting place and uh, hello everybody hello Thomas this is the first time we've met uh, so thank you very much for inviting me uh, Carmen and team um, yeah, the, it's basically the, we call it the, the Centre for Internationalisation and Parallel Language Use, a very grand name, but it, basically it's the, it's the University of Copenhagen's Language Centre, but it's fairly unique because it's, it's certainly unique in, in Denmark. Um, we are a, a, both a, 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 a research centre and a resource centre and obviously then a, a training centre, a language training centre for mainly English and, and Danish and um, we the center was opened in 2008 um and it's it's got this name because the because english and danish now are have equal status they are parallel languages mm -hmm. uh, parallel teaching languages at the university of copenhagen and in fact um in some of the faculties for example the science faculty all their masters programs are taught through the medium of english uh -huh. I, th I think it's an interesting link up because I'm not familiar with this um, uh, concept in Italy where I work, but I think it is very important because I think um, we do we do have to work for internationalisation and most universities have a separate department for that. And I was in just I just thought it was a good solution to put them together. And I like this idea of parallel language use. <laughs> and it, it's just English and Danish, isn't it? You don't uh, German, for example. No, we we are primarily there for English and Danish. So we teach uh, um, yeah, we teach English to um, students. We teach English to staff. I, my uh, my job is actually teaching staff. I, I don't personally teach students at all. I only teach staff. So both academic staff and obviously uh, quite a lot of administrative staff. Um, and then some of my colleagues well, teach well, Danish. Yeah. Okay. Well, the fact that the university can you can assign you just to teach staff and administrative, you know, uh, academic and administrative staff shows the importance they they they, they give to these things. Because, uh, for example, where I work, we do teach academic and we do teach administrative staff, but it's kind of fit it fit in between the other things which we do. And, okay. And, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 
That, I, I suppose in that sense, yeah, I've got a, I've got a great job as a language teacher. Okay. I'm very, very lucky. Yeah. <laughs> Look, so so that, let's talk about let's talk about these courses that you talk about yeah. in your your article because you've been running courses of this kind more or less for ten years. Yes. Yeah. In, in one form or another. And I mean, you say at Copenhagen, there are 4,000 administrative staff. Yes. I'm yeah. just OK. And um, th these courses are organised um, of six to 12 participants. And then they are for the specific um, areas of competence of the administrative staff. And um, what, what levels do they come in at your administrative staff? Because I would imagine that there would be I would imagine they'd be higher than where I work. For example, yeah, the... I, 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 my um, just what I've heard, I guess Denmark, uh, Denmark obviously generally is known as a country that has a very high level of English for mm -hmm. for various reasons. All, all the television is subtitled; it's not yes, dubbed. Yes. That's that's one big reason. And because Danish is such a small country in a small language, they have to have some sort of lingua franca um, mm -hmm. when they whenever they go outside Denmark, basically. So they tend to be very good at English. And that also means that a lot of the academic, in an academic world, the textbooks for years and years, have, a lot of them have been in English because uh, it, it simply, it simply is not cost effective to translate them. So, um, so that's, that's sort of, uh, so the, the level of English is quite good. The people that I teach, generally they are B1, B2 mm. um, on the, on the CEFRA. Um, on the Sephra scale and so they are all they can all speak English and in fact that is a prerequisite for coming on my courses because the courses that you've been reading about they're what we call these terminology courses yes so they are very much technical language in the administrative staff and you mentioned Thomas um, that I teach different groups of administrative staff um, basically broken down into HR staff uh, study administrative staff and finance staff that's the basic mm -hmm. that's the most and they and, and they you said that you uh, if you started to give them a general course and then the students themselves asked for more specific courses for their fields yeah that's a, yeah that's what, you have read the article well um yeah right at, right at the beginning when i started back in uh, 2009 2010 we had this we had this idea that we were going to run a, a, a course for administrative staff but it very, very quickly became evident that, that people dealing with finance, dealing with budgets, talking to researchers about having to, how, how to handle their budgets and, and uh, account numbers and so on, um, they were, they, their, their needs were very, very different to people coming, working at HR who wanted to talk about maternity leave and, and uh, the yes. holiday rules. <laughs> so we split, yes. we very quickly split them up. I think it's very good that you're also been very responsive to what the to what the, uh, the the course students have wanted as well. I think I think you have to be, don't you? Because yeah. um, these university staff, in a sense, are our colleagues. We can't teach them. We can't treat them simply as students. And also, they know what they are doing and they know what they want. So, yes. Yeah. I, I think it's important to be responsive. You said that um, um, you drew up a, a core vocabulary. How did you draw that up? I mean, this was initially, um, but, but how, how do you decide what vo what vocabulary to teach the students, it, this specific vocabulary? Where do you get it from? Um, well, it, initially, uh, and you're probably referring initially when I started and I didn't know much about university administration uh, when it started some 13 years ago. But there was a translation center at the university and we asked them to send us what they considered to be a core of, it was actually a list of 500 terms and job titles that they considered were core um core vocabulary for for administrative staff then uh and then i then collated that and put it to no i did the opposite of collating i split it up into different areas um and one, and, and then when we split the started splitting the courses according to the different kinds of administrative staff, then obviously HR, that it soon became apparent that certain terms were HR terms and certain mm -hmm. terms were finance terms. And then since then, I've built up the vocabulary simply by running the courses and mm -hmm. people coming up and say, what's that in English? And how do you say that? And me producing 
vocabulary lists. So I still add words to, after all these years, I'm 13 sure, yeah. years. I still add, I add words and terms that I actually haven't come across for some reason. Well, yeah, absolutely. I just wondered from, from an English as a lingua franca point of view, which is a personal interest of mine, I just wondered if you came across any kind of terms in English which were being used within the university, which um, were not being used in, were not used in, in, in English speaking countries. I mean, you sometimes come across these terms like in Italy when people talk about a badge, for example, when they mean a swipe card, these kind of things. <laughs> Have you found any examples? Uh, yeah. oh, uh, I'm thinking on my feet. Mm -hmm. They that there's a there's a false friend in, in Danish uh, for the, the, the Danish word for an external examiner is a censor. Ah. So, so everybody, including a lot of English-speaking uh, um, staff and students, just use a sort of shortcut instead of saying uh, we need to have an uh, an external examiners meeting. They say, well, we need to have a censors meeting, or we need to we need to contact the censor about this. So, so I spend a lot of my time telling them. That. That's a very <laughs> that's, a, that's a very good example but you see working within these systems you have to kind of use the vocabulary which is which is evolved naturally within that system as well yes. um i just wondered a final point because then we have time for the for the general answer and question session at the end i just wondered um i mean because we've been conducting courses for our administrative staff uh, during covid we had to put them online and i think we're keeping them online because the administrative staff prefer it that way so because they can you know do the course from their office i just wondered i mean um uh, what's your attitude to that just to hear your opinion <laughs> my my at my attitude is that it worked that it's it was very useful during covid but that I, I think, to be quite honest, I think it's a second best to face-to-face -face, uh, teaching. And um, we, do, we do virtually all our teaching face-to-face uh, -face now. Um, but also, you, do it, you, yeah. you, do, you do it well, in my opinion, because you do short lessons, don't you? You do 45-minute lessons, which I, it would be like three or four times a week by my uh, Yeah, well, the, 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 the most common course structure is actually a one morning a week so it's three and a half hours okay. Over, over, okay. over five weeks um, okay. and the other thing is that if typically people come from all over the university but it's at Copenhagen isn't that big so and it's quite easy to get around so okay. most people are quite happy to come and we do also run tailor-made courses and then and then I go to one part of the university and obviously that's a very is, that's a very neat solution for it means that people can stay and, and be taught in their work in their actual geographical yes. workplace as well and i see i see that you use a lot home study as well which is a very good you you factor yeah. that in which yes. is very good an integral part of the course it's not home study if you feel like it it's actually in and i, I also i recommend to everybody because you, you, um, you've, you've got some very good examples of activities at the end of the article as well which are, are very very interesting so thanks for sharing them okay i think we, we can stop there because we're running slightly over aren't we um, no problem so thank you thank you peter thanks very much thomas yeah. Thank you very much to both of you. So now I think we approximately have uh, 15 minutes for question. Carmen, is that correct? Yeah. Yes, right. Okay. So if anybody has questions for the authors. Not for the first ones, since Maybe. they have left, but... Uh, either for Julia and Laurent or Odette and Pilar or then for Pete and uh, Thomas. I think David wants to ask a question. David. Oh, okay. Yeah, hi, hi. Um, thank you to the authors for these um, presentations. They're very interesting. Um, there's a lot of talk about SDGs here at Potsdam and um, I think that's going to be very important for um, language instruction as well. Um, so I'd definitely be reading that article. Um, and also the English for um, staff, there's uh, more interest for, on the part of the administration that our center be providing courses like that. What is the retention rate? Um, because I think it's, um, 
there, there are some courses offered not from the language center, but by other um, centers here at the university. And the colleagues that take part in these courses report that um, usually they're the last ones left in the course. People start just disappearing. Um, what's your um, experience been with that? And how can we work on um, retaining uh, employee uh, participants? Uh, are you asking me, Pete? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, basically, we basically it's because the department the uh, the department has paid for the courses. We have an internal market, so they have a certain they have a certain commitment to actually come into the course. And generally, the retention rate is very high, um, and people don't don't drop off for no reason. It, it, they only drop off if they if they're ill or something. And so that's because they have already committed uh, and the department has committed some some basically some some cash. Um, mm -hmm. And and also, it, I mean, that's one side of the other side is these are people who want to improve their English for their job. Uh, they want to feel they want to improve their English. They want to feel more professional. So there is a lot of motivation to take these courses. You might have said this or this might have been in your article. But is there some sort of certification um, that they receive? Uh, not, not for the admin staff. No, I'd, if, a five-week course is it's it's to upgrade their mainly their terminology, and it's uh, we we have no exam um, as such. We do have as a centre we have developed separately a certification um, procedure for academic staff. Um, that we also sell uh, both internally and to other universities in, in Denmark um, called the Test of English Proficiency for Academic Staff that we developed at the university. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't know if there are any other questions for the moment. No. We have some comments uh, on in the chat. Uh, uh, these papers, as Stu is saying, these papers and this conversation have been excellent. So glad I could attend. Thank you to Stu. And then Evelina, she's, uh, she's leaving. Uh, she has to go. And we say goodbye to her. And I just answered them. <laughs> Woo, wonderful. And yeah. yeah. Well, I had a question for Julia, actually. Uh, I read um, Laurent and Julia's article with great interest because I know the class very well, one of the two certifications. And uh, I was wondering about the uh, CERTA class certification. Uh, from what I understood of the subject you chose as an example in the article, uh, it seemed to me that um, it was mainly for uh, social psychology students or students in the social sciences, rather. So would you give the same type of subject to science students? In fact, it, it wasn't designed for social, uh, for social sciences. This was an exam for engineers. Our, the really? basis of our exam is that it should work for everybody. That means that we don't have a, a specific uh, section for engineers or doctors. So we work with general English. That means that in many cases, it's going to be social sciences because it's easier for everybody to relate to that. Uh -huh. So we do try we do try for it to be uh, a bit uh, for it to be contextualized in uh, not an academic but a professional context. But what we test is their ability to express their ideas, to discuss uh, a topic, to be able to defend uh, what they believe or to uh, agree on something. And in order to do that, we need to choose topics that uh, do not uh, give, let's say, an advantage to certain students mm -hmm. over others. And for that, we tend to use general 
uh, topics. And general topics nowadays tend to be closer to, to that of, uh, of the social sciences because it is general English. But no, it's not at all designed for uh, social studies. And in fact, during the, we do pre-trials of all our tests before we actually take them to, to a uh, real life administration. And nothing goes forward unless it's been proven that it works equally for uh, science students and for social science students. So yes, this exam was administered to, um, if I'm not mistaken, to engineering, uh, one engineering university and three, I don't know if it was one or two engineering universities and three social sciences universities. So yeah, but it is general English. We don't do uh, uh, specific purposes. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. Because I know that the class has uh, specific areas for uh, yes. specific categories of students. Okay. Yes, that's why we were saying that the construct differs because we work yeah. with general English, not specific, not specific purposes. Okay. We, we definitely have much. categories. Uh, but they're really wide ones. That is, we consider wide domains of studies, uh, health, uh, economics and accounting, uh, human sciences, uh, engineers, et cetera, et cetera. They're really wide categories. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is only for C1, yes. Yeah, okay. Thank you. I don't know if there are any other questions. Apparently not. Then, Carmen, I'll let you conclude the event. Thank you very much to everybody. Thank you to the authors and their interviewers. Carmen, and the maybe we want to Maybe we can show the, the our final slide, uh, the slide that we prepared. Oh, sorry. Where are they? I need to find them again. <laughs> <laughs> I do remember what we, <laughs> what we have. Uh, in that slide, um, but anyway, I'll try. I'll try to open it. Yes, 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 okay. yes, yes. It's coming. All right, it's coming. I also want to thank all of you, uh, authors, interviewers, participants, uh, Anne, for being such a nice and pleasant host for thank us. Thank you. I'm, I'm lost in my screen. No, up. Oh, okay, I'm going to. See. Share if it's coming. Let's uh, see. That should be that one. Can you see it now? Yeah. It's coming. Yes. The, the, the final one. Oh, the fi that's not the one. final one. Sorry. Yes. Sorry, Norman. And no problems. And we obviously want oh, yeah. to. That's it. <laughs> it was just a thank you one. I have forgotten about but, one. <laughs> uh, we want Sorry. to encourage you, to invite you to read the articles uh, that have been presented this afternoon and all the others, of course, because uh, it's... Uh, um, all of them are very, are very interesting. And obviously we want to thank you for being with Circles. We know that some of the authors were not Circles members in the past and they, and they became Circles members throughout their, this journey, let's say, with us. And also stay, stay in touch through the papers of the LLHG Journal. Uh, we will have very interesting uh, contributions coming up very soon in the spring uh, with the 13.1 uh, issue and then in the autumn uh, fall season again 13.2 uh, and most of them not all of them because as you um, as you know we need to integrate uh, between uh, um, uh, papers that come from uh, very given calls uh, and papers that come from independent authors. Um, authors, uh, circles members, uh, and independent authors. Um, uh, but we received, uh, uh, let's see if I remember, 15 articles uh, coming up from the um, circles, uh, circles Conference uh, that was held in Porto last September. So uh, these are these are um, uh, fifteen uh, um, articles and four 
actually five activity reports. So, so many other uh, contributions coming up very soon. We, uh, we are looking forward to go through them and, uh, and obviously the, the, um, the usual uh, reviewing process uh, will start uh, very soon. But uh, this, uh, these two issues, uh, uh, I believe that these two issues will be very, uh, again, very interesting issues. And then final thing from uh, Anne and us, <laughs> me, uh, enjoy your winter festivities. <laughs> yes, of course. And, and your vacation for those of you who have vacation, but I, I hope everybody has vacation. It's Christmas. Yeah. Goodbye to all of you then. And thank, and you, thank you for attending. For being with us. Thank, thank, you. Thank, you thank, thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 Thank bye. you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Bye, Thomas. <laughs>